about this thing uh, called the G-Union. Uh, it's a new GM utility in the FreeBSD kernel that I actually wrote because I had a itch that needed to be scratched, uh, as you'll see. Um, and for those of you that were in my class, the first couple of slides are going to look very familiar. Uh, for the rest of you, it, when you hear GOM, you don't even know where the heck that is in the kernel. I figured I should really just start out with the big picture that's the whole kernel on one slide. And so the, the system calls come in at the top, and the hardware's down at the bottom. And uh, as one Intel hardware engineer said to me, all that other stuff is the friction that makes our hardware look slow. Uh, but we like to think of it as FreeBSD. At any rate, uh, the, you, you come in at the top and you go through file systems or devices or whatever, uh, and GOM is actually pretty far down in the kernel. You've gotten through your file systems, and at this point now, you are trying to actually get to the physical media. And the GOM layer is often referred to as the disk management layer. So GOM deals with things like RAID or striping or uh, no, anything having to, things to do with sort of getting a I.O. request ready to hand down to an actual device driver that's going to take some action on it. Or potentially, if it's, you know, you're striping, it may have to send, split the request and send it to two different places uh, or whatever. Okay, so there's actually a whole lot of other little things that get plugged into the GOM layer, uh, and uh, G, uh, this G union is just another one of them. So you can think of it as, as you know, sort of another disk layering uh, piece. So just to sort of get the, the gist of, of how the GOM layer actually works here, um, one of the things that it does is things like disk partitioning. And so when you talk about, you know, some particular slice of a disk, this is the place where we actually figure out where that is on the physical media and, and, and send it down to the appropriate place. And what actually happens is that this layering or the labels gets set up as the system is identifying the disks and configuring them. So what happens is at the beginning, uh, the, the, the code is going down and it's, it's looking to see you know, what hardware is there and it comes across a disk and this being the first one that it's found, uh, it decides, all right, this must be disk DA0. And then what happens is that the, uh, the GOM layer um, announces that a new disk has showed up uh, and part of that is that um, the identifying the disk DA0 caused an entry to be put into slash dev, which is that dev slash DA0. Uh, and now the, the, uh, the GOM layer is notified that it's there, and the GOM layer hands it off to uh, various different uh, things that have indicated they're interested in disks. And they taste the disk, which really means they read the first few sectors of it, and they look at it to see if there's anything in there they can they identify. And sure enough, the GPT taster finds a GPT label there, and this particular GPT label has uh, two slices. So it creates DA0 slice 1 and DA0 slice 2 and makes those corresponding entries in the slash dev directory. And now that looks like two more disks that just arrived, and so more tasting code goes in. Uh, and this time, at the beginning of slice 1, uh, the tasting code finds a BSD label. And so the BSD label then produces, uh, in this case, dev DA0 slice 1A through DA0 slice 1H. And they all now show up. And of course, they look like disks, and so the tasting layer will go again, but it doesn't find at this point anything else. And so this whole process now stops, and we have the, the, all of that bit of the disk. Now, other things that might be there, uh, if, for example, we have two disks that are being mirrored, then there can be a label that says, well, I am part one of a mirror, or I am part two of this mirror. And so when both of them have been found, then that will cause the mirror uh, dev entry to be created. 
All right, so GM layer then can do things like disk partitioning. Uh, you can do the aggregation of disks, as I just described, from mirroring or rating or whatever. Also, since all the I.O. is coming through this layer, it's an ideal place to do collection of I.O. statistics. Uh, and so we can, we can collect those, and those are the statistics that ultimately get propagated up. For example, when your process exits, if you ask for the statistics, you can see how much I.O. it did. Uh, it's also a, an ideal place for doing I.O. optimization, so things like disk sorting, uh, which, of course, is uh, important for spinning rust, not so much for solid-state disks. Uh, so, but this, again, is the layer in the system where that kind of thing happens. This is an example of how mirroring would work. Uh, in this instance, we've found two disks, DA0 and DA1, uh, and they have uh, GPT labels on them, so we get the slices, and then it turns out that at the beginning of uh, DA0 slice 1 and DA1 slice 1 is a label that says this is a mirror, and so those two are put together and, uh, as a mirror, uh, and then again that looks like a disk, so tasting happens there, and in this particular instance it finds a BSD label, and so Finally, up at the top there, we have dev mirror uh, DA0 S1B and so on. All right, so uh, again, the, the mirroring of this underlying partition uh, is uh, you know, just happens at this layer in the system, uh, and there's all kinds of ways you can configure your mirror, and that's all in that label that comes at the beginning. So. You know, do you favor one over the other? You know, maybe one is a is flash and the other is spinning rust, and so you, you want to try and do reads off of the, the flash or whatever. Um, at any rate, that level of stuff again is all being done here at the, the GM layer. Now, how does GM actually operate? Well, when GM was first created, uh, we were still back in the sort of FreeBSD 4, 5, 6 era, uh, and those of you that were around in that era know that it, the, the 4 to 5 was the great uh, move from uh, uniprocessor to multiprocessor, uh, and uh, that meant a whole lot of locking had to happen. It was a very painful transition because you can't really just do it in bits and pieces. You sort of just have to bite the bullet and do it. And the problem was, of course, all of this underlying device drivers were not set up to do uh, multi-threading. They, they, they didn't have the locking added. And to have to put all that locking in all at once uh, was just a, a mind-boggling task. And so th to avoid that, uh, the way GEOM worked was it single-threaded the, the requests that were coming into the devices. So uh, it would come down, and you, it would go through the GEOM layer, uh, and then it would queue it uh, to be run by a, what's called the G down thread. So there was a single thread that would take these requests off and then run it down through the rest of the stack and through the device driver. And then when the I.O. completed, a G up would come back up through the code. And so in this way, uh, n nothing basically below the GOM layer needed to be multi-threaded. Uh, it would just, the, the G up and G down would serialize everything that was going through. Uh, two things that came from this, one is that modules couldn't go to sleep, because if they went to sleep, they would go to sleep with the G down thread and everything would come to a screeching halt. So you, you really don't want to let that happen. Uh, similarly, coming upwards, of course. Uh, and you don't want them to compute excessively. So you don't want to have one of your modules do something like encryption, because that you know, everybody else is going to wait while your block gets encrypted before anyone else is going to get to do more I.O. Uh, so again, uh, you, you, you couldn't put things in there that, that needed to do a lot of CPU time. Uh, now, the idea, of course, was you know, this is going to be, it's going to slow down the performance of the system dramatically. And so we had to have a way of being able to incrementally uh, start putting the locking in. And so what happens is that as a module uh, gets SMP locked, it can set a flag and says, all right, I can deal with multiprocessing. Uh, and that turns 
means that we now do what's called direct dispatch. So the thread coming in doesn't have to queue up on the up or down, it just goes straight on through down into the, the, the lower layers and the device driver and so on. And so, it, you know, it's all SMP and, and it's been locked, so that's going to work. So if you looked at, if you look at, for example, like a five, a version five of FreeBSD, almost nothing is direct dispatch. And if you look at the system today, I, I don't think there's anything that isn't direct dispatch. Um, but that's sort of the history, and if you've been looking at it, uh, you know, people say, well, what is this thread that's G up, and what's this other thread that's G down? Well, they're mostly sitting there being bored because uh, they almost never get used now. Okay, two other key things that, that GOM is doing for us is that if a provider goes away, then an error gets propagated up the stack. So if your disk goes, you know, goes away, someone, it, you know, it's something that's on a USB stick and you pull it out, then it's not there anymore. And so now uh, the GOM will propagate an error back up. And any I.O. that was in progress will be finished with, it, with EIO and you know, that EIO error will be propagated up and then the higher layers have to deal with that. Uh, and anything that was queued, if there was, if there was a stack for G up or G down, anything that's on those queues will also all be errored out and sent away. Uh, the other thing is uh, when a uh, provider changes, this is called spoiling, um, then that gets propagated up the stack. And spoiling is something such as uh, the, the disk label, uh, you know, identifies, you know, a, a GPT label. And so the fact that there's now these two new disk uh, entries is going to get propagated up. And it's that propagation going up where the, the, you know, things like the entry will get made in slash dev and uh, other operations may occur uh, based on that. Okay. Well, now that you're all uh, well set with, uh, with GOM, let me now talk about a couple other things that I need to, tools really, that you need to know about um, before I can finally get to GUnion. Um, the next one of these is the memory disk. Uh, and a memory disk is kind of what it sounds like. It's something that looks like a disk and acts like a disk and quacks like a disk, but actually isn't a disk. It's really just memory. Um, and you create and operate on memory disks with the mdconfig command. And the, you, there's essentially three different kinds of memory disks that you can allocate. Uh, I'm going to describe on the next slide the details of these three. But there's one that's essentially just malloced kernel memory. It's just solid memory in the kernel. Uh, there's virtual kernel memory, so it's virtual memory, i.e. it's backed by swap, and so, you know, the active stuff will be in memory, and the stuff that's not active is going to get pushed to the swap area. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can have virtual, it's virtual memory, but it's actually backed by a file. Uh, the, the, the one that's backed by swap just disappears when the disk goes away, but the one that's backed by a file the file has whatever the contents of that thing was, and so you can recreate it um, by remapping that file. Okay, as far as GOM is cons consumers are concerned, it just looks like a disk. So what are the, the, the details on this memory? Well, malloc, in this case, the changes are all held in the kernel memory, and the size is limited to the amount of kernel memory that's available uh, in a single kernel malloc. So, it's, I, I don't remember exactly what that value is, but it's some relatively small number of uh, megabytes. You're not going to be generating any gigabyte-sized uh, swap-based or uh, malloc-based disks. Uh, it, honestly, I'm not quite sure why you want that. Maybe, it, I mean, if you're doing some kind of a benchmark and you want to know that it's in memory, uh, that will guarantee that it is in memory. But uh, other than that, it's not a terribly useful one because usually you want disks that are the size of other disks. Okay, so swap mode is the changes are all held in the buffer cache uh, and pages get pushed out 
to the swap area when the, the system gets under memory pressure. Otherwise, they stay in memory. So for the most part, you know, when you first touch a page, a, a piece of well, a sector or multiple sectors on one of these disks, pages get allocated to it. And they pretty much just stick around unless we start getting short of memory. And if we start getting short of memory, then the ones you haven't been using get pushed out to the swap area. All right, and then the vNode mode, instead of just having an, an anonymous object in the kernel that's holding it, uh, it's a regular file. Uh, I typically, if, if I want to save the changes over time, then I uh, create a large empty file. So you just say, let's say I need a one gigabyte uh, virtual disk, so I just say truncate one gigabyte, name of you know foo, whatever the name of the disk is going to be, and now I get a giant file that has no pages in it. Uh, and then I tell MD config, all right, map that file. And now, anytime you write stuff, of course, that part of the file will get allocated. So it will just be a, a sparsely populated file. Of course, the more of it you use, the more space it ends up consuming. Uh, but the difference between the swap-based one is that when pages, when the pages are reclaimed, then they get written out and actually the contents are actually in the file system and when you break down that disk, when you MD config throw it with the destroy option, uh, it will push any of the dirty pages out to that file. So later you can come back and reattach to that file and it comes back looking just the way it looked before. Okay, so for swap and vnode, the space by, used by the memory disk is based on the amount of data that's written to it. All right. Finally, we can get to G-Union. Okay, the G-Union module is used to track changes to a read-only disk on a writable disk. So it looks a little bit like the Union file system, except that it's being implemented at the disk level instead of at the file system level. And uh, what, you, what we're gonna do here is that we are going to take uh, one disk, uh, which is going to be treated as read-only, we're going to have another disk on top of it, which is going to be read-write, and now what will happen is uh, that when a write request comes in, uh, they get intercepted and they get stored on the top disk, so we don't, we don't modify the lower disk. Uh, when a read request comes in, we first check to see if that block is in the upper layer, and if it is, then uh, that you get the thing that's in the top layer, and if it's not there, then it just falls through and reads what's ever at the lower layer. Uh, so it's you know, pretty much exactly what you'd expect, except that it's being done at a block level rather than at a file level, which is the way that the union file system does things. Okay, so the picture we have here is uh, we have two disks, uh, in this case, I'm using a memory disk for the upper layer and a real disk for the lower layer. So we have DA0 there, and it's got a couple of partitions, slice one and two. And now I take the, uh, the memory-based disk, I slap a label on it uh, so that which it'll have the same size partitions. And now the union is going to be the union uh, with the real disk on the bottom. And treated as read-only, and the writable disk is the memory disk, and that's the one that's going to be on top. And so when the union gets created, we'll end up with slash dev slash md0 slice one dash da0 slice one dot union. Uh, and that will be the name of the disk that looks just like this one over here, but uh, is, is being mirrored, or not mirrored, but is being uh, tracked by the, the memory-based disk. All right, so what are the actual operations uh, that we have with the, the, the G union? Uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. We have create, which sets up the union provider on the top of the two given devices, and assuming that it succeeds, the new provider appears with the name, as you saw on the previous slide. Uh, and then we have the inverse of that, which is destroy, which disassembles the two pieces. So 
you go along and you create this thing and you do a bunch of stuff with it, you know, reading and writing, whatever, and uh, then you're done. And now you say, all right, did that do what I wanted it to do? Uh, and the reason that I actually created it is because periodically people send me these disk images that causes FSCK to choke. Uh, you know, it, it tries to fix it and it either fixes it wrong or FSCK blows up or whatever. And they inevitably send me some disk image that's, you know, four terabytes. And so here I have this four terabyte image of the disk and now I run FSCK on it and FSCK croaks. And it's like, okay, well, I put some debugging in FSCK or I scratched my head a bit. Now I want to try something else. And I have to make another copy of the four terabyte disk, which takes 25 minutes to do. Uh, and, you know, then I run it again and it's like, ugh, it, you know. After you've waited 25 minutes a few times, you get really bored with that. Uh, and so I created this so that I could just put this on top and I run FSCK on the union disk and, you know, when it dies, I just say revert. And revert says change, discard all the changes made in the top layer reverting to the original state of the lower device. This takes less than the time it takes for a carriage return because all it has to do is zero out an array of bits, one bit per block, and then, you know, the, nothing has been written to the top. Uh, so, it, you know, you, you just have a G union revert sitting there, so you run type FSCK, it, it does bad things, you say bang G union, and it throws all those changes away, and, and you do the next one, you do the next one, et cetera. If, you know, you, you, know, you say, well, <laughs> that's great, but who besides McCusick ever deals with FSCK? Uh, and you'd have a point there. Um, it seems like no one else seems to want to take it on. But uh, there are other times when it could be useful to you. For example, you have some disk and something bad has happened to it. And so you, one of the things you can say to FSCK is FSCK minus Y. It says just answer yes to everything. Uh, and uh, then it just goes roaring through and does that. And you know, one of the states you can end up with is it can just decide that your root directory is bad. And so it just ends up creating a brand new empty root for you. Uh, and uh, the lost and found with, you know, all the files in it. And that might not be the optimal solution that you were hoping for. So, uh, you know, you might actually then want to go back and say, well, there's a couple things where I said yes in FSCK and I didn't really mean to say yes. Well, if you've used the G union, you can just revert that and say, okay, okay, I'm th minus Y was a little bit over the top and then go back and, you know, Keep working on it until it's exactly the way you want it, and then you say, okay, finally it did it. Um, then you want the commit command. And the commit command says, write all the changes that are in the top layer to the bottom layer. So make this union disk, make the lower disk look like the upper, like the union. Uh, and so then when the commit is done, um, voila, it's, you've got the new disk image. Okay. So you see there's not just me that's going to use this. Okay, so um, the upper disk has to be at least the size of the disk that it covers. That should be kind of obvious. Um, the other points, though, are that the union metadata exists only for the period of time that the union is instantiated. So it's important to commit the updates before you destroy the union because otherwise they're just gone. Um, now, if the top disk is using 4K sectors, then that bitmap that this keeps track of what's, in, what's been written is only about half a percent larger than the disk that it covers. So it's possible, although not currently implemented, uh, to save the union metadata between instantiations of the union device. So out sort of past the end of the disk, you could just write that bitmap. Uh, and of course, if, the, if it's a MD disk and it's mapped by a file, then you could just reload that file and then the union would be able to pull the bitmap back and it would know uh, what the changes look like. Okay, but since I didn't need that and nobody else has asked for it, I didn't bother putting that in yet. All right, so let's go through and just take a look at sort of the, uh, an example of this. Um, you know, sort of what, what are the commands? So the first one, um, 
is to create a, uh, a, one of these providers. And so you say, in this case, G union create minus V just says give me verbose output like what you're doing. Uh, and uh, then MD0 is the top and DA0 P1 is the bottom. And that will then create the, the union disk and then you can just mount the, that union disk on slash MNT, assuming it has a file system on it. If it doesn't have a file system, you can new FS it and then you can mount it. Okay, uh, then you proceed to make your changes in the mounted in slash mount, and if they're successful and you want to keep them, then you just unmount slash mount, and then you can do a G union commit uh, of that union, and that makes all the changes get pushed to the lower layer. Uh, yes? Sorry? Still didn't hear you, sorry. Oh, is there a reason you have to unmount it? Yes, because when it's mounted, you may have state in the cache, uh, and particularly dirty blocks. Uh, and you want to make sure that all the blocks have been written to the disk before we do the commit. OK. Um, so, and in fact, if you try and commit when it's still mounted, it, it will complain. It will refuse to do it. OK. Um, if, what, on the other hand, you, you're not happy with what ended up on slash mount, um, then you can unmount it and revert it, and that will just put everything back to the way it was. And then when you're done, you can just eliminate it, you just unmount it, G union destroy, and uh, all the uncommitted changes will be discarded when that destroy command is done. All right? So, what is this useful for? Uh, well, I've already alluded to the reason that I created it in the first place. Uh, it's uh, when you're dealing with large disks with corrupted file systems and you're not quite sure about the repairs, uh, you create the G-Union disk. If the, the, you, know, you run FSCK minus Y or whatever, and if that fails, then you just revert to changes and try again. Uh, and if it's successful, then you, com you know, do the commit. In this case, it's not mounted, so it, you, know, you don't have to do the unmounts. Another thing, though, that I actually found is kind of a uh, poor man's ZFS, if you will. Uh, you can place the upper disk over the one holding the file system that you want to upgrade uh, and then mount that. And then you just run the upgrade on that top thing. And if you're happy with the, with the upgrade, it didn't, you know, nothing bad happened, then you can commit it. And if you're not so happy with it, then you can revert it, and that brings, it brings you back to where you were. Now, of course, if you've got ZFS, then you just make a snapshot and then a clone, and then you update that and you know, push it across. So as the practical matter, if you're running ZFS, then you don't need this. But if you're in a system where you, you're running on UFS, for example, in an embedded environment, uh, this is actually a, a, a safer way of going about trying to do upgrades. I mean, th of course the script always works, but just in case it doesn't, um, you're, you're not sitting there hosed. And even on a, an embedded system, you're likely to have enough uh, virtual memory capability that you'll be able to actually create the uh, MD disk and, and use that on the upper layer. Okay? Well, there's one other GEOM module that I sort of like to talk about, just since I've got everybody's attention here and I have like five minutes left. Um, and that's the GEOM NOOP module. Uh, it's a GEOM module that does absolutely nothing, or at least that's what it used to be. Uh, it was originally written to provide the boilerplate to, needed to create a GEOM module. So, you know, when I wanted to create GUnion, you know, I didn't have to just start with a, a blank sheet of paper. I just made a copy of the NOOP module, and then I just started adding the functionality for the GUnion. Except when I first looked at it, it's like, well, wait a minute. This isn't, doesn't, isn't a NOOP. It does all kinds of stuff. Um, and it turns out that uh, the, uh, these features that have been added to it are, are, again, useful, particularly if you are into uh, benchmarking things like disk performance. Uh, so uh, 
you can do something where you export just a subset of the underlying provider, so it's sort of the poor man's way of putting a disk label on it. Um, and, uh, but other things are, for example, when I was doing the work to uh, deal with disks failing and unmounting the file system rather than panicking the system, you can add the geom layer. So you just have your regular disk, you add the geom layer, and then that's what gets mounted. Uh, and you say to the geom layer, just die. And so it, it's as if the, the disk just keeled over. And you know, uh, any I.O. in progress fail and any attempts to do anything fail. And uh, so you know, it's, it's the dying disk without actually having to plug and unplug disks, which you know, they tend not to like that very much. Uh, another one, though, that's more for benchmarking is to apply a possibly variable delay in reading and writing through the layer. So you can say, well, you know, randomly make a read take longer, randomly make a write take longer, and, and it's, you can specify, you know, is it like one in a hundred or every single one or every other one or uh, whatever. And again, you'd be surprised because, of course, what this is going to do is cause IOs to be done out of order. And there's a whole lot of things that kind of expect things to be done in order, and when they're not done in order, they kind of don't work very well. Um, it, I mean, at least it, from a performance perspective. So um, again, you can really do some sort of interesting tests with this variable delay. Uh, and then there's another one where you can specify a probability of just flat out failing for reading and or writing. And uh, again, this is one where you're, you, you're essentially simulating where the disk is like kind of working, but not completely working. And again, there's a whole lot of programs that are just, they don't check for EIO. Uh, so, you know, bad things start to happen. Okay, so it's great for testing error recovery code, delay handling code, correctness of out of order IO. Um, and, uh, and by the way, if you actually want to create another module, um, we should really have a true no op GEOM module. But um, it, it still is, you know, pretty close to what you need for uh, a, a using as a template. All right, and that is what I have to say. So I will entertain any questions that people have. Yeah. Uh, how much trouble can you do to write out the state to a different new device instead of committing it to the underlying device? Uh, yeah, so the question is, how difficult would it be to write out, you're talking about the bitmap. Uh, yeah. So one is the, uh, in an assignment, I want to modify it. Normally I want to change it to the standard and reboot. But if I upgrade it, I want to change it to the other partition and select another RG partition. Uh, well, if, you ha if you're using MD and you simply have it associated with a file, um, then that file will just be, a, you know, a a sparse file. And so the amount of, it'll look like it's huge, but it, the amount of disk space it'll use will be proportional to the amount of writing that you do. Uh, if you actually have other media, then of course the other media will just have that data on it. Okay? Uh, it, I, I don't know if this is relevant to say how many people have your email list, <coughs> but the user has to ask for that. So you need right now the CVD or the CD or the get uh, something from the control line system, the control line system for people who are playing with it, and the people who pay for the email list get to use space somewhere. Yep. That's the lower layer. You cannot, you cannot get to the lower layer for the free and the reboot. Right. Uh, so the question is, uh, do I have of, of writing out the, the bitmap state. Um, it's on my to-do list. It's like a day or two project to do it, so it'll probably happen at some point. I'm more or less waiting for somebody to come along and say, you know, it'd be really nice if that happened. <laughs> yeah, some are, well, it's a little too easy for that. <laughs> okay.
So the, the question is, if, is it possible to write onto the lower layer? Um, the, the G union won't do that unless you do the commit command. And when you do the commit command, it will attempt to write the top changes to the bottom one. Uh, not as long as the, can, can someone else write to the lower layer? No, they can't, uh, because any time a disk is open for uh, writing, it has an exclusive access bit set. So, I mean, just in general, any disk that's open for writing, nobody else can open it for writing. Like, if you've ever tried to run FSCK on a disk that's mounted, it, FSCK starts out by saying no write because it tried to open it for writing and it wasn't able to do it. It'll then still run through, but it won't try and make any changes because it can't. Yeah? Is it possible to keep the G union mounted read only while reading? Is it possible to make the union mount? Read only. Uh, so there, there wouldn't be any jerk or uh, Yeah, I mean, you downgrade it to read only. Yes, you could. And if you do that, then you can do the commit without unmounting it. Because downgrading it to read only is flushes. Yes. Um, the, the, what, when you have a memory disk that's backed by a file, when you tell the memory disk to, to go away, before it goes away, it, it makes sure that all of the, the pages that are in memory and modified will have been pushed to the backing store. There's, there should probably be an MD config sync option, which is, you know, just push it without destroying it. But uh, at the moment, the only way that, that it gets flushed is when you destroy it. Did you do an action on that file? Like to set up a data sync? Yes, actually, yeah, that's a good point. If you just do an F sync on the file, that'll get it out. Like data sync is the same as read. Yeah, because, I mean, the, you know, the pages are associated with the file like they would be with any other file, so an F sync will do it. Good point. Yeah. The question is, does the top one have to be a, a memory-based disk? No, it can be a real disk. If you, if you just happen to have an extra, you know, four terabyte disk lying around that you can use, um, you're free to use it. All right, thank you very much.